1844 to 1984. Okay, uh, thank you. It's um, a little strange to be talking at the very end of this conference almost about history, but uh, I, I guess the analogy I think of is when you're taking a ride on a jet plane, it's sometimes relaxing to think about going for a ride in a Model T Ford and remembering that in its time a Model T Ford was a remarkable invention. So <laughs> in the same spirit, um, I, I want to start not quite as early as Gary did, but really with the work of Coomer. And in some sense, my whole talk will be about the work of Coomer and its, uh, its implications. So, so as we now know, some special cases had been done before Coomer. In particular, two was done in antiquity. Three by uh, Fermat, uh, at least uh, he said he did it, and uh, Euler wrote it down. Four, Fermat said he did it and did write it down. Five was Dirichlet and Legendre, I believe. Um, Dirichlet did 14 and LeMay did seven. Uh, and that's where it stood until LeMay claimed that he had done the general case uh, in a talk to the Paris Academy in 1847, I believe. And almost immediately, Louisville suggested that there were some problems with his approach and in particular, as is well known, the problem of unique factorization uh, was raised. And then in a letter from um, Dirichlet, it was pointed out that Coomer, who had been working in relative obscurity, had actually three years earlier proved that in general this unique factorization doesn't hold, and in particular a concrete case when p is 23, the class number of q of zeta p is greater than one, and so so any proof that depended on unique factorization had to be modified. Okay, so that is a little bit of the background. Now I want to go into, before I start uh, on what Coomer did, into really ancient history, just because it's amusing. Um, everyone thinks about Fermat in, con in the connection with the method of descent. And I once came across this fact in a book on the history of, I guess, the calculus. But here's a beautiful proof by descent that the square root of two is irrational. So suppose the square root of two was the quotient of two integers. Then you could make a nice right triangle where the hypotenuse, n two n squared is m squared, so we'd have n, n, and m. So we'd have a right triangle with um, integer sides and integer diagonal. And then it's very easy to supply the details of this. If you lay off a segment of length n on the diagonal, so like here, and draw a perpendicular, and then look at this little square up here in the corner, then a small amount of geometry will convince you that this new square up in the corner also has integer sides and integer diagonal. And consequently, since you can iterate this uh, construction, uh, you're getting into problems. So the square root of two is irrational. So the method of descent, I think the, um, the numbers are, well, this side is clearly um, m minus n, and the hypotenuse is uh, 2n minus m. So you don't even have to draw the picture if you want to be an arithmetician. You just start with a solution, uh, n squared plus n squared equals m squared, and then you get a new solution to the same equation by these formulas and keep going. Okay, so, um, so much for that. Now, to start off, I want to, uh, there's a very simple case in which you can give a proof uh, which uses the main idea that was the, the main idea with all possible, not all possible, but all proofs that were attempted, or almost all proofs, I won't be categorical, uh, before the recent decade or so. And that was, if you, have x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, then the method is you factor the left-hand side as a product x minus zeta i y equals z to the n. And then you try to exploit um, 
the fact that this product is in nth power to show that the individual terms are nth powers and so on. Now, there's one case where this works beautifully, and that's in a polynomial ring. So I want to just to illustrate the method. Let's suppose we start with a ring which is a polynomial ring. Chalk isn't working that well. Um, in one variable over a field. Now, what I want to sketch a proof of for you, it's very quick, is um, that if there are any solutions in that ring, the, it must consist of constant solutions. There are no non-constant solutions in that ring. So the idea is this. Suppose you did have a solution, and suppose the maximal degree of um, x degree of y degree of z is um, call that d. And suppose it's greater than 0. And the whole thing here is to prove that you get, a, a, starting out with such a set of solutions, that you can get another solution, which is also a non-constant solution, but has smaller maximal degree. And then by descent, that shows you're in, in, in trouble. Well, this is a unique factorization domain. Oh, yeah, I should say we, uh, it's harmless to assume that k is algebraically closed. So I assume it. Um, so it is a unique factorization domain. So it's also easy to see that we can assume that x, y, and z are pairwise relatively prime. And once you do that, from this factorization, if you look at any two terms in this factorization, you can see that they're relatively prime. OK. So if a product of relatively prime things is an nth power, each one has to be a unit times an nth power. But we're in an algebraically closed field, so every unit, non-zero unit, is an nth power. And I can adjust things so that, in fact, each of the factors are nth powers of polynomials. So I then write that down for the first three factors. x plus y is equal to, say, w to the n. Uh, here's where I'll, let me call that w0 to the n so I can keep track. Zeta y is w1 to the n. And x plus zeta squared y is w2 to the n. Okay, where those are polynomials. And now the thing is that you have three equations, but think of, thinking of x and y as unknowns, you can eliminate them between these three equations and get a linear relation among the other terms. If you just do a little simple algebra, that will wind you up with the equation w2 to the n plus zeta times w0 to the n is equal to 1 plus zeta times w1 to the n. OK, and now finally, if you just take the nth root of zeta, you can write x prime equals w2, y prime equals the nth root of zeta times w0, and z prime equal the nth root of 1 plus zeta w1. And you've manufactured a new solution to your original equation. Uh, the degree is positive. It's easy to check that the, it couldn't be true that all these were constants because then x and y would be constants, and therefore z would be a constant. You would have been starting with a constant solution. So uh, it's a non-constant solution. Its degree is at most d over n and positive, and so you just do the thing again. Um, now, someone should ask, uh, what happened to n equal 2? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> when n equals 2, the square root of, primitive square root of 1 is minus 1. In that case, 1 plus zeta is 0, and you see you don't wind up with a new solution, which are all non-zero. So luckily, it doesn't work for 2. OK. <laughs> so let me see now. Blue goes up. OK, so now. What happens if we try to do this sort of thing, uh, but with the original problem? Um, so we, we start. Now, I, I think I will immediately specialize to prime exponents. As everyone knows, if you've taken care of 4, you only have to look at odd primes. So instead of working with n, I'll work with x to the p 
plus y to the p equals z to the p. But now I'm looking for solutions in the integers. If I stay in the integers, I'm in trouble because this doesn't factor over the integers. But if we add a p root of unity to the integers, we get the same factorization as we had before. And now the problem is twofold. Um, if you add the, you do this factorization, you're working in the ring z of zeta p. Th these rings had been um, already present in earlier work. I mean, Gauss introduced the Gaussian integers in working in biquadratic reciprocity, and Eisenstein and Jacobi had put a cube root of one here when trying to discover, and discovering, in fact, cubic reciprocity. And people were used to working uh, w with these rings, but perhaps not in this generality. And now, two problems arise if you try to imitate the proof of polynomials. Uh, one problem is that it's not a unique factorization domain in general, so uh, that part goes away. And the other thing that's a problem is that there are lots of units in this ring as soon as p is greater than or equal to 5. So, and they're not so easy to take nth roots of um, like we did in that proof. Uh, so, so the units get in the way. Yeah, and in fact, I think a lot of people, um, when they hear that LeMay tried this proof and didn't have unique factorization and sort of assume that unique factorization is the whole deal, it really isn't. I mean, even if you had unique factorization, if you didn't know something substantial about the units, you still couldn't do the proof. So, I mean, Coomer's contribution in, in, in sort of solving this conundrum for at least many primes was twofold. He, he investigated the class number and he investigated the unit group. Okay, and I guess a lot of what he did is really the foundations of what we now call algebraic number theory. I mean, it, it's quadratic number fields or, or their equivalent theory, binary quadratic forms, had been investigated a lot. But the things that Coomer now did were really new and amazing. And, a lot of the results I'm about to write down were done in three years, from 1844 to 1847. So it's a remarkable outpouring of uh, very ingenious stuff. So I'm going to make a list of various things he did, and then I'll comment on some pieces of this. OK, so one, invents ideal numbers. So he didn't have unique factorization with the actual elements of this ring, but he invents things called ideal numbers, and those, he proves, do have unique factorization. Um, I'm not going to use Coomer's language of ideal numbers. I, I, I'm much more comfortable with Dedekind's language of ideals, and I assume most of you are also. So even though it's somewhat ahistorical, I'll just call these ideals. And, and okay. Um, OK, so he invents these numbers and proves that there is unique factorization into prime ideal numbers. Uh, secondly, he discovers the laws, uh, discovers laws of decomposition. So if you take a rational prime, so you have the situation z of zeta p, you take a rational prime in z and see how it factors in z of zeta p, he writes down the whole familiar uh, thing uh, very explicitly. In fact, he even shows you how to do this very um, concretely. And the only one I want to mention, uh, everyone knows uh, these laws, but just because I want the notation, the prime p, if you take it up here, ramifies completely. It's a principal ideal, and the generator is just zeta p minus 1. So this is of degree 1 and z mod to p. Uh, it's the pr this is of degree 1, so the residue class field is isomorphic to z mod pz, and that's used a lot. In fact, in Coomer's work, uh, completing at lambda and looking at lambda attic expansions is used a lot, except he never passes to the limit. So it's often said that Coomer was an expert in piatic analysis. Well, of course, he never saw a piatic number, but he was perfectly familiar with working mod lambda to the n for large n, and it's really equivalent. 
So for example, he invented the p-adic logarithm, but he never called it that and never took values in the p-adic numbers and so forth. Okay, so two, so three, he defines the class number, which I'll call HP, and shows it's finite. And then, a brilliant piece of analysis using ideas of Dirichlet, he gets an analytic class number formula. So I'll discuss this in greater detail in a while, but I just want right now to point out that the class number factors as a product of two pieces, which I think are more easily remembered as the real class number and the relative class number, but in, in the classical literature it's called uh, the first and second factors. And I'm not sure that it's in that order, but uh, uh, I'll call them the real and the imaginary, or the real and the relative. And actually, HP plus is the class number of the field Q, the real subfield. OK, so the analytic class number formula is a formula for each of those. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment because I want to write down each piece of that. But the um, other... Now, some of these tools are perfectly general and are interesting, you know, just for their own sake. And certain tools he invented because he wanted to apply them uh, to Fermat's last theorem. There's some dispute about whether he was more interested in the reciprocity law or in Fermat's last theorem. I think there's no doubt that the record shows he was more interested in the reciprocity laws, and, and that's why he devoted most of his effort to this. But he also spent a lot of time thinking about Fermat's last theorem. So even though I, my own f feeling after reading this stuff is that although um, he valued one more than the other. He certainly didn't think that this was just idle to, to think about Fermat's last theorem because he spent an awful lot of time at it. Um, anyhow, the, the next thing I wanted to um, mention is, do I have my, that's three, four, okay, good, five. <laughs> okay, he shows that P divides H plus implies P divides H minus. And th this plays a, an important role, as we will see soon. And now, finally, I want to mention two theorems about units. He shows the following. If, if U is a unit, then it can always be written in the following form, plus or minus ZP to some power times E, where E is real and positive. And this is a relatively easy theorem. And now here is a relatively hard theorem. It says if um, U is a unit, and suppose U is congruent to a rational integer mod P, then this implies that U is a pth power. This is, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, definitely for regular P. So if P does not divide the class number. Thank you. Yeah. Not divide. <laughs> All right, now it's right. Uh, definitely for regular P. So it's one of the places where that's used most strongly. Um, I'm a little puzzled about this formulation. Uh, an almost equivalent formulation is to ask that U be congruent to a pth power modulo lambda to the P. So this is a little bit bigger modulus than that. This is P to lambda to the P minus 1, really. Um, but this is the form that it comes up in the proof, uh, same conclusion, with the same hypothesis and this, the same conclusion. 
And all, I, I think it's worth pausing for a moment to um, say something about how these things, this one in particular, is proved. Of course, there are his proof, which is very long and complicated, has to do with, uh, uh, in a moment I'll define the cyclotomic units. So he, he defines these cyclotomic units and looks at their lambda attic expansions and does a very close analysis of, of the p attic logarithms of cyclotomic units. Using that, together with the analytic class number formula, and it's a tricky calculation, he uh, proves this theorem. Uh, if you're interested in a nice treatment of that approach, Bravich Shafarevich in the final chapter does, does it that way. Um, a, a modern, a more modern uh, point of view would be the following, and he, it's, it's a nice proof. You take, suppose U satisfies, well, either condition, but this is, again, in a more familiar form. Just add the pth root of U to QP. Or not QP, sorry, Q of zeta P. So take Q of zeta P and adjoin the pth root of U. Okay. Now, um, we're claiming that the hypothesis gives us that U is a pth power downstairs, but suppose not. Then what you have is a cyclic extension of degree P. Since it's the pth root of a unit, it's unramified at all primes away from P. And then you check locally at lambda, the only prime above P, and you see this condition is exactly what you need to show that such an extension is unramified at P. So in that case, you have an unramified cyclic extension of degree P, and by class field theory, we know that that implies P divides the class group. Now, another historical remark, since class field theory was not available, uh, Hilbert has a very beautiful theorem in his Salberish called Hilbert's Theorem 94, which doesn't use class field theory, and says that whenever you're in a situation, not even so specific, you have a number field and a cyclic unramified extension of prime degree, then there's an ideal downstairs that's not principal, uh, that becomes principal when you go upstairs. Uh, it's a familiar sounding thing, but uh, immediately you can see from that by taking norms that that ideal has order P, and therefore P must divide the class group. So th there is a way uh, of using this technique and not having to, you know, quote the existence of the Hilbert class field or something like that. Okay, so, um, okay, so now I want to um, quickly recall some definitions about the analytic class number formula and then give you a sketch at least of part of the proof that if P is a regular prime, then uh, Fermat's last theorem is correct. Okay, so um, the details would probably, uh, they, no, definitely would take too long. So let, let me just, the analytic class number formula. So there are two pieces to it, H plus and H minus. H plus is uh, obtained this way. You define units. You look at zeta sub A to be this unit. Zeta to the A minus 1 over zeta minus 1 times zeta to the minus A minus 1 over zeta inverse minus 1 square root. And you can pick the square root so it has this very nice form. It's sine pi A over P divided by sine pi P. Okay, if, um, if A is not divisible by P, this is, in fact, the unit. It's not an interesting unit if A is equal to 1. However, it's an interesting unit for A greater than or equal to 2 and less than or equal to P minus 1 over 2. Uh, and one can show that if you just take the, the, these units in that range, they are mul multiplicatively independent, and generate a subgroup which, together with the roots of unity, um, are a finite index in the whole unit group. So you define the cyclotomic units, I'll just call them CP, to be the group generated by these P 
people together with plus or minus the roots of unity. And uh, let's just call EP the whole uh, unit group, and then you can show, or Coomer showed, that the index is the um, positive part of the class number. Okay, on, on the other hand, for H minus, let's take a Dirichlet character of Z mod PZ star to C star, and define the generalized Bernoulli number B1 chi to equal 1 over P times the sum chi of A, A, A equal 1 to P minus 1. There are other ways to write this, but this is, I believe, correct. Uh, these numbers are not interesting if chi is an even character. Uh, you can rapidly show that if it's a non-trivially even character, it's zero. But for odd characters, they're interesting and non-zero because of this theorem that HP minus is equal to 2P times the product I equal 1. Um, no, I'm sorry. The product simply over chi odd of minus one half B one chi. Excuse me? Oh, that pi, uh, I didn't mean that. Two P. It's translating to Greek. No, no, no pi in this formula. <laughs> okay. All right, now of the two formulas, this one is much less uh, mysterious in some sense because this involves, it's not so easy to see how to compute this index. I mean, it's an interesting theoretical fact, but it doesn't uh, immediately tell you how to say anything intelligent about HP plus. There are ways, by the way, at least to test the P divisibility of HP plus, but for lack of time, I won't go into that. However, this is a very, um, useful formula, it's a finite sum and so forth. So um, it's good. Now, I guess I want to next tell you how to get from this formula to Coomer's criterion to tell when a prime is regular. So let me give that definition officially. P is regular if P does not divide HP. Okay. Now, this is if and only if P does not divide HP minus. Because remember I said earlier that P divides HP plus implies P divides HP minus. So since HP is a product of those two numbers, uh, using that fact, you see that P is regular if and only if it doesn't divide HP minus. So we need some way of telling when P uh, divides or does not divide this. And Coomer uh, had this beautiful way of relating this problem. I mean, maybe it's obvious after you've seen it many times. Uh-oh. <laughs> I knew these blackboards would cause, okay. Um, but there's a nice connection between these generalized Bernoulli numbers and the ordinary Bernoulli numbers. And the easiest way to uh, state that is to make things somewhat piatic and to introduce the Teichmuller character, and then you can say things rather um, nicely. So, there is a character which goes from ZP star to the piatic number, the unit, piatic units, um, and has the nice property that if you apply omega to an integer, you get a certain P minus first root of unity, and that's congruent to A mod P. So it's a character of order P minus one. It's uh, easily seen to be an odd character, and um, there's sort of a piatic class number formula for H minus. So it's just a, a rewriting of the other one, and it's very easy to prove from the other one. HP minus is 2P times the product 
minus one half v one omega to the minus i i odd. It's, like, it's from 1 to p minus 2. Um, and the equality is to be read inside zp. So think of this is an ordinary integer. It's in there. Each of these things are in zp, and this equality is in there. So, so um, this comes right out of the other formula when you think about it for a little bit. And of course, it's very nice if you want to um, discuss p divisibility. So here's yet another thing that Coomer did. I don't think he used this language, but suppose i is odd and p minus 1 does not divide i plus 1. Then b1 omega to the i is congruent to b to the i plus 1 over i plus 1 mod p. So he has this nice congruence relating um, ordinary Bernoulli numbers to these generalized Bernoulli numbers. Okay. So now if you use that congruence and this equality um, and a little extra work, which I won't do, you wind up with the famous Kuma criterion. So the Kuma criterion. P is regular if and only if P does not divide B2, B4, Bp minus 3, where Bp minus 3 is the last prime, Bernoulli number. <laughs> this is a, the last Bernoulli number that has to be considered. So anyhow, this is really great because one can compute these Bernoulli numbers there's a recursive formula for them, and you can test them for p divisibility, and that's a really concrete way of telling when a prime is regular or not. And Coomer actually sat down and computed for all primes less than 100. So p less than 100, they're all regular with three exceptions. 37, 59, and 67. So once he had proven his uh, great theorem that P regular implies Fermat's last theorem, he had now extended the list of uh, cases for which Fermat's last theorem holds to all primes less than 100 except for these three. Okay. Now, he later published a paper in 1857 in which he handled um, the case of irregular primes of a special type. Um, for lack of time, I think I'm not going to r write down all the conditions, but they're roughly this. Um, the prime should divide the relative class number precisely once. That was one of the conditions. The other condition was a certain congruence conditions for the cyclotomic units or some altered form of the cyclotomic units and it assured the, that these modified cyclotomic units were not Pth powers. And finally, there was a hypothesis that P cubes should not divide B sub I P, where I runs through the same range, 2 to P minus 3. With those three conditions, he claims that Fermat's last theorem is true, and then he goes on to verify those conditions for these three primes. And so, uh, he claims to have proven P for all primes less than 100. Um, Vandiver, many years later, in the 1920s, criticized a, a lot of things in that paper. Um, and I'm not sure what the status of those criticisms are, whether Kuma really did have some problems. And, but in any case, uh, Vandiver wrote a paper subsequently which um, proved a very similar theorem, much more general theorem than, um, than Coomer's. And so what Coomer said is certainly true, e even if there are some problems with the proof. And so, oh, I, th I thought I'd uh, just very, very briefly say something about Vandiver, who um, was an American mathematician who seemed to have been quite obsessed with, um, with um, Fermat's last theorem, devoted a good part of his life to um, 
finding numerical criteria and other criteria for um, proving it. Um, he'll come into the story a little later on uh, in, in another way, but uh, it's interesting that he was a professor at Texas for many years and is very well known. He's the only American mathematician mentioned in Landau's three-volume treatise on number theory. In fact, I think the last theorem in the third volume is a theorem of Van der Ver's. Uh, he also never graduated from high school, which just goes to show you. <laughs> um, by the way, another comment they want to make about um, these primes is that uh, there's a probabilistic argument that Gary gave that the percentage of irregular primes should be something like uh, 60%, a little over 60%. Uh, precisely, the fraction is e to the minus a half, according to the argument. And that's held up very well. The most recent data we have is due to uh, Joe Bueller and three others whose names I don't have at the tip of my tongue. But anyhow, th there were computations made that show for all primes up to 4 million. If you do a frequency count, the percentage of uh, regular primes is roughly what it's supposed to be. Um, however, and in spite of that, there's no known proof that there are infinitely many regular primes, even though we do have a proof that there are infinitely many irregular primes. Okay. So, so now, with all these various tools, I now want to briefly, I hope, because there are a few other things I want to say about this general subject, I want to give you an idea, at least, of how Coomer proved his, um, his theorem. And, and the thing is that Coomer claimed actually more than Fermat's last theorem. He claimed it was true not only over uh, the rationals, but over the uh, cyclotomic field. So the theorem is this. If P is regular, then um, x to the n, eh, not n, x to the p plus y to the p equals e to the p has no non-zero solution, that meaning all three coordinates are not zero, non-zero solutions in q of zeta p. So, um, No, I think I th that's kind of interesting. Um, and he made, it, it's also interesting that Coomer makes a mistake in proving this. He, um, he comes to a point in the proof where he says, well, here's x, y, and z, and suppose they're integers in this field. Uh, there's no loss in generality, he says, in assuming that they're pairwise relatively prime. Now, in a unique factorization domain, that's perfectly correct. But since uh, he knows that the class number may be bigger than 1, the greatest common divisor of x and y might be some ideal that's not a principal ideal. And then it would be impossible to factor it out. So he gives the proof under that hypothesis that x, y, and z are pairwise relatively prime. And it's a valid proof that for three pairwise uh, relatively prime numbers in this, uh, in this field, well, in the integers of this field, uh, and with p regular, there are no solutions. But it was later fixed up. I mean, it's not too hard to uh, fix up the proof and show it's true in this generality. So an interesting question is, is there some possibility that this is true, this statement is true for all primes? See, I, I don't think the methods of this conference would extend to proving uh, that, although I, I not an expert, uh, but I've asked experts, and they, they told me that. It, uh, uh, so, so there's something challenging left to be uh, thought about, at least. Anyhow, here's the idea of how to prove this. There are two cases, the famous two cases. So if x, y, and z are in, um, I want to do something intermediate. I, I want to sort of give you the idea of what Coomer wrote down. So suppose there are uh, th these three integers pairwise relatively primed, I will assume that. And the two cases are lambda does not divide x, y, z, and lambda does divide x, y, z. <laughs> okay. And the method of proof in these two cases is quite different. 
Okay, the first case is proved not by using descent, but assuming that there is a solution and uh, deriving a contradiction. Uh, basically, you, uh, the, the main tool in this uh, part of the proof is that unit, the, the fact that every unit can be written as a power of um, a root of unity times a real uh, unit. You sort of, when you, you write down the factorization and you, uh, you, you come down to a case where, where you have x plus y is equal to a unit times a pth power, x plus zeta y is equal to a unit times a pth power, and so forth. And now you look at congruences modulo p. Well, pth powers are congruent to ordinary integers mod p. So if the unit is a power of zeta times a real unit, on the right-hand side, you have a power of zeta times something real. So you now take complex, con you look at congruences mod p downstairs. You now take complex conjugate. The real unit doesn't change, but everything else goes to its conjugate. You divide, you set things equal, and you, in a few steps, get to a contradiction. But there's no dissent in, in that part of the proof. It's in this part of the proof that there is dissent, and, and here's how it goes. It, it's interesting what the dissent is on. Let's suppose that lambda divides z. And then you look at a somewhat more general equation, x to the n plus y to the n, is equal to a unit times lambda to the mp z to the p, where u is a unit and uh, m is greater than 1. And um, yeah, and n equals p. Um, oh, and x, y, and z are pairwise relatively prime. So x, y, and z pairwise relatively prime. That's, as I said, is not necessary, but that's what I want to look at for the moment, just to give you the idea. So, um, so if you're looking at the second case, clearly, uh, if you have a solution of Fermat in the second case, you can put it into uh, this form. But the claim is that there are no solutions uh, in z of zeta p with these uh, conditions. And the proof goes this way, and I think I'm going to just, um, I was going to write a lot of stuff down, but I'm not going to. Um, the way it goes is this. You factor the left-hand side. Um, since when you write the product of those linear factors, the right-hand side is divisible by lambda, the left-hand side is divisible by lambda. So one of the factors is divisible by lambda. But the difference of any two of the factors is divisible by lambda. So you get out of that, that all the factors on the left-hand side are divisible by lambda. By arranging, so there are, um, there's a little trick that has to be done with semi-primary uh, elements, but what, what happens is you, you can arrange things by multiplying x and y by roots of unity, and if necessary, you can arrange things so x and y are congruent to integers a and b mod lambda squared. That's trivial to do. Just by multiplying by a suitable root of unity, you can arrange for this to happen, where a and b are ordinary integers. Okay. All the terms on the left-hand side are divisible by lambda, but this says that x plus y is congruent to a plus b mod lambda squared. So if x plus y is divisible by lambda, a plus b is divisible by lambda. So p divides a plus b. It's a rational integer. So lambda squared divides this. It says that the first term is divisible by lambda squared or more, and all the other terms are exactly divisible by lambda. Now you write that information down in terms of ideals. You, you factor out. Um, you'll have these lambdas uh, on both sides canceling out, and you'll have a product of relatively prime ideals being a pth power. OK. Yeah, all right. So maybe, um, maybe, let me just say that, x plus y, just not to be. The exact power that has to divide the first term is, um, I'm looking now at the ideals. So this has to be m minus 1 times p plus 1. And then there's a c0. I'm looking at the ideal. x plus zeta y is equal, that's going to be exactly divisible by lambda c1 
x plus zeta to the uh, p minus 1 y uh, is equal to lambda times c p minus 1. OK, so, so you uh, get to this point, and then, and because of the hypotheses that x and y are pairwise relatively prime, these, these c's are relatively prime. But if you multiply all this out, the powers of lambda on both sides cancel, and you get c0, c1, cp is equal to um, z, I believe, to the pth power. We're looking at ideals, so the unit goes away, and um, you have a, an equation like that. Now, this means, since these are pairwise relatively prime, each ci is equal to di to the p, for di some ideal. But I claim ci is principal. They're all principal. Because here's a principal ideal, and this is lambda some power. That's a principal ideal. So C0 is principal. And similarly, they're all principal. So these di's are ideals whose pth powers are principal. Now we use regularity. There are no elements of order p in the class group. So each di is, in fact, itself principal. So di is equal to wi. OK. Um, red. <laughs> All right. So, should it go up a little further, I guess? All right, so what does that um, lead us to? If we um, now substitute that information in, we get some interesting equations which are similar to what we got in the polynomial case. Did I call it W, I hope? Yes. So if you substitute that information in, you get three equations that look like this. x plus y is a unit times lambda to the m minus 1 p plus 1 um, w0 to the p. x plus zeta y is u1 lambda w1 to the p, and x plus zeta squared y is equal to u2 lambda w2 to the p, where u0, u1, and u2 are units. Now, once again, you use that trick. Th these three things are three equations with x and y in them, you simply eliminate x and y from the three equations, you get a re linear relation among the other, on the other side. And there'll be some 1 plus zetas, but those are units. If you, if you work this out, um, you easily put the final result in this form. w1 to the p plus some unit times w2, no, it's w0, if the way I have it, is equal to an other unit times w0 to the p times lambda to the m minus 1 t, where e1 and e are units. Uh, it can't be w0. Uh, this is 2. This is 2, I think. At least that's the one I have here. It doesn't, up to numbering, it's, I think this is right. All right, so, so now remember earlier I proved, or at least sketched, that m was greater than 1. OK, so the right-hand side is divisible by lambda to the p. So we therefore have that e1 is equal to minus w1 over w2 to the pth power modulo lambda to the p. OK, so that tells us that e1 by Coomer's 
unit lemma is uh, a unit to the pth power. And it's just here that that's used. You see, the, the left-hand side is not of the right form because of this unfortunate E1. But now, using this congruence and uh, Coomer's uh, theorem, E1 is itself a pth power. So this is just eta. So now I have a new solution uh, of the type I was uh, looking for. W1, eta W2, and W0 are pairwise relatively prime because their divisors were pairwise relatively prime from the earlier part of the proof. Um, M minus 1 is bigger than 1. And we're back in our original situation. Except we've replaced M by M minus 1. Now do the proof again, and again, and again. <laughs> Every time you're lowering the exponent, and you never come to an end, so there's something wrong here. And the, what's wrong is that you couldn't have had a solution to begin with of the required type. So, so that. Um, That's, um, OK. It, it, that was the way Coomer uh, did it. And as I say, if you want to see the modified version of this, um, I think the last chapter of Breivich, Shafarevich, does it also um, with making no assumptions about pairwise relatively prime. It actually loses a little in beauty when you do it that way. I think this, in, in this um, method, is just a little bit prettier to. Uh, work out, but one does want the, more, the greater generality. OK, now I want to conclude with making some remarks about a problem that one is led to by thinking about irregular primes. So you have Q of zeta p. And if you can look at the class group, and inside that, there's the p CeLo subgroup. So to say that P is irregular means that uh, this is a non-trivial subgroup. It's clearly of interest. And so the question is, what is the structure? Of this group. And a lot of effort has been devoted to that. And um, the reason why I think it's not Fermat's last theorem, but the reason I think it's legitimate to bring it up is that another contribution of Coomer is a key to understanding how to go about dealing with this problem. So uh, very briefly, uh, let's use the standard notation. Z mod PZ star is isomorphic to the Galois group of Q of zeta P over Q. And so let me just use the notation um, A goes to sigma A. And sigma a has the action on zeta p of raising it to the eighth power. OK, now um, this is a p group. So it's act, let's call this also, uh, pardon this notation, this is not the decomposition group. Well, uh, well maybe it is. <laughs> uh, but it's just, I just mean it to be the Galois group of that extension. And, and so we know that the, the group ring acts on uh, AP. Okay. Now, uh, this is a group, a group of order P minus 1. The P minus first roots of unity are in here. So there are a complete set of orthogonal idempotents in here, and they're easily seen. You can write, let's call EI to be 1 over P minus 1 times the sum of um, omega to the minus i a sigma a. Okay. And then we can break up a p as the direct sum of a p sub super i, let's say, where a p super i uh, is equal to epsilon i. A. OK. So if you want to understand the structure, since there's this natural group acting, it's good to break it down first into pieces and see what happens. Now remember, omega is an odd character. So um, these pieces, the, and the group acts on each of these pieces by you know, sigma a 
acting on the ith piece is like multiplying by, by omega a to the ith power. It gets scalar action on the pieces. Okay. Now, the point is that the odd exponents correspond to the relative cl class number or the, or the p part of the relative class number, and the even exponents correspond to the real subfield. Okay. So one would like to say something about these pieces. For example, you'd like to know something about their size. Now, that's a long story, but what I want to mention is the Van Dever conjecture, or Van Dever's conjecture, which I'll just call VC, states that for all P, P does not divide um, HP plus. Okay. So if you make that assumption, by the way, um, Kumer evidently or had already thought of this, and it, it mentions it in a letter to Dirichlet, I think, as, as a nach zu beweisenden Satz. It's something he, he still hopes to prove, but it's still an open conjecture, although it's been verified up to four million. For primes less than four million, it's true. So, um, and there are arguments to show that even if it's false, it's not false very often. So it's, uh, it's, it's um, you know, probabilistic arguments. So if it's true, then this sum, by the way, I should point out that A0 and A1 aren't there. Very simple arguments can, well, not so simple for A1, but simple for this. This is zero. Um, and then again, if you have this conje conjecture, that means the even part is not there, so it, you have a sum like that. So if you assume Van der Ver, then it breaks up into this type of sum. Okay. And now, there are a number of theorems about the size of the pieces and, and their shape. And uh, so I want to conclude by just mentioning some of them, because some of them have been proven by methods that have been very prominent at this conference, namely modular forms and representation theory and so on. In other words, methods very far from the type of methods I've been speaking about in this talk. So, okay, we're assuming Van der Ver, so we have that decomposition. Now, another thing, um, if you, there's something called the reflection principle, which is due to uh, Iwazawa in this case, and Leopold in general, which says that the rank of the even stuff uh, sort of tells you information about the rank of the odd pieces. In particular, if this holds, then all the even parts uh, go away. And using this principle, this implies that A, P, I, I odd is cyclic. Okay. All right. So, so then the next question is, if you have a group that's cyclic, what's its order? Okay. And so here's the theorem. I'll first state this theorem, and then I'll make remarks about what's true in general. So if you have Van der Ver's conjecture, this particular theorem I'm about to state can be proved without any fancy machinery. But it does depend on one thing that is due to Coomer, uh, as I will explain in a second. And let me just write this down. It says, there we are. Uh, assume Van der Ver's conjecture, then A is equal to A minus, is equal to A3 plus A5 plus AP minus 2. Uh, the claim is that the ith component in this sum, that is i odd, is isomorphic to z modulo p to the m i z, where m i is equal to the ord at p of the generalized Bernoulli number b1 omega to the minus i. Finally, m i is greater than zero 
if and only if P divides the ordinary Bernoulli number P minus I. That's really quite wonderful because it tells you, you know, just very explicitly what this group looks like under this assumption, which, as I say, is unproved but is true in a lot of cases, like all cases up to 4 million. Um, okay, now what are the ingredients that go into this? Well, the cyclicity of the pieces is due to uh, this reflection principle. The, um, what happens in the proof is you show that B1 omega to the minus I annihilates the ith piece. And the reason for that is Stickelberger's theorem. You just take the Stickelberger element appropriately modified and apply it to the ith piece, and out comes this generalized Bernoulli number, which is going to kill that piece. But Stickelberger's theorem in the case of a prime is due to Coomer. It is one of the things that Coomer proved in that very productive period from 1844 to 1847. So we therefore know that the ith piece is a module over ZP modulo B1 omega minus I ZP, which is isomorphic, by the way, I've defined things to Z modulo P to the MIZ. Okay. So it's a module over this r little ring, and it's cyclic over this ring, so the order has to be less than p to the mi. So the order of the ith piece, by what I've said so far, is less than or equal to p to the mi. Now take the product over all i. You get, when you're taking the product of all the a's, you get a minus, which is a in this case. On the other side, if you look at the p-adic class number formula, you get the order of A. In other words, you get equality. So you had to have equality all along, and therefore um, you get this uh, much is true. Now finally, uh, to prove the last step, to prove the last step you do this, B1 omega to the I, minus I rather, is congruent to, I'm sorry to, be in a corner, and I'll finish in a moment. I'm a little bit over, but I'm almost done. Uh, this is uh, B, just this, because omega has this periodic with that period. And this is you add 1 and divide by 1, so you get B to the P minus I over P minus I mod P. So to know when this is a p unit or not, you just have to know whether p, b p minus i is a p unit or not. And that tells you when you have um, the pieces trivial or not. Okay. Okay. All right, this being the case, again, in, in the Bueller paper, and I'm sorry for not mentioning the other three authors. I, I should have written it down. But. Okay, well, um, they show that, um, they do these, they show that P exactly divides these numbers for, in, in the range they consider, you never have a P squared, it's only P. And since they, they check Vandiver's conjecture, we have this nice theorem for all primes up to four million, that A is isomorphic to Z mod PZ to the I of P, where I of P is the so-called index of irregularity meaning the number of Bernoulli numbers between 2 and p minus 3 that are not the even ones that are divisible by p. So this gives you, we know the exact structure for all these primes. And um, just to finish, the uh, names I did not mention were Herbrand, <laughs> um, Ribbit, who proved the converse of Herbrand's theorem, and one of the earliest applications of modular forms and representation theory to this stuff, a paper of Wiles in which he proves that if AI is cyclic, then the order must be as predicted without any other hypothesis. Now, in other words, he doesn't assume Vandiver. And then Mazer Wiles, which proves that the order is as predicted altogether. 
I mean, they don't say that the ith piece must be cyclic, but the order is the p part of the, this Bernoulli, generalized Bernoulli number. So, um, all right, I've gone on too long, but I'll give you some idea of what happened before today. <laughs>